Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof, the whole team here, for this opportunity to present a broad overview of some of the issues and processes that have guided the building of the modern and contemporary collections of the Museo de Arte de Lima, a project that has been almost entirely based on one basic premise. Though the consolidation of these collections happened at a time of rising expectations regarding a new international art marker and broader patterns of globalization, the museum, both by conviction and by force of its economic limitations, decided to define itself as a local institution. It is important to point out that this mission is in no way tied to the notion of a national museum bound by official narratives but rather to the idea of an institution that works through the issues that are pertinent for local history and society. This perspective need not be provincial or parochial. It is in fact open to regional and international discussions based on matters of common interest. Today, as I explore some of the challenges and possibilities of working with this notion of a local institution, it may become evident that there is in fact no real paradox in doing so in the context of a conference on the Global Museum. Founded in 1954, a late beginning for an institution that aspired to serve as a national collection, the museum had to strive to make up for lost time. The few donations that gradually filtered in during those early years did not suffice to establish a solid museological narrative. This changed with the Prado family bequest, a large collection of archaeological artifacts, paintings, sculptures, and decorative arts that defined the museum's range and scope as a panoramic survey museum of art in Peru from the pre-Columbian period to the present. Yet this donation, made in the opening years of 1960s, in fact expressed the vision of another era. The selection had been shaped at the turn of the century by renowned jurist and historian Javier Prado Ugarteche on the screen of view of his house, scion of one of the most powerful families in the country, and a dominating presence in cultural and political life. His vision of art history remained tied to the 19th century paradigm of the fine and decorative arts. The collection was a strong in traditional genres and particularly in academic painting, but understandably blind to forms of production that modern artists and critics would incorporate into artistic discourse in the decades after his death. The Prado bequest created the vast scope of the museum's collections, which is greater and more diverse than most comparable national museums in the region, generally divided along the traditional lines of the disciplines of archaeology, art history, and anthropology. The result is a museum collection that is heterogeneous and complex, which presents curators with great challenges and at the same time opens up extraordinary opportunities. Over the past decades, we have strived to develop an acquisitions policy that can adequately engage the enormous potential that the collection offers for rethinking art and its history. Just a few views of the galleries that shows a bit of the diversity of the collection. The permanent galleries, in fact, open with a great painted screen, which shows the succession of Inca kings as a representation of modern political legitimacy, in which the last Inca appears to hand the scepter to the liberator of Peru. It was painted in 1837 by Marco Chiitupa, a Cusco painter who himself claimed descent from the Incas, and who found inspiration in a colonial iconographic invention. And its complex interweaving of diverse moments and traditions it gives material shape to the very idea of history. The collection reflects the importance that the imaginary construction of the pre-Columbian past has had as a central aspect of modern and contemporary culture, perhaps since Luis Montero's foundational Funerals of Atahualpa. In the 1920s and 30s, artists like Elena Isque vindicated the aesthetic value of pre-Columbian art. Until then, uh, which had, had until then been marginalized from proving art history. In the 60s, Jorge Eduardo Eyelson 
recover the poetic dimension of incarnated chords. And slightly later, Emilio Rodriguez Larraín brought critical irony to nationalist discourses in works like The Gold of Peru, a piece that questions the commonplace that opposes a glorious heritage to a decadent present. The contemporary collection has made a concerted effort to incorporate these reflections from local and international perspectives. To mention but a few works that speak to these issues, there is Venezuelan artist Alexandra Apostol's Inca's Room, a piece that critically juxtaposes phrases from the CIA website with images of the wallpaper that decorates the Inca's Room in the Rockefeller Family House in New York, a central space for Cold War cultural policies or Susana Torres' Neo-Inca Museum, an installation that critically deconstructs the past by exposing, for example, the absence of women from representations of power in the pre-Columbian tradition, or Luz Maria Bedoya's deadpan, anti-touristic vision of the Nazca lines as viewed from a car window. In the broader context of the archaeological and historic collections, these contemporary works demonstrate how the museum can elaborate on a local agenda while taking distance from official discourses of the nation. To the temporal issues shaping Mali's collections, one must add the charged complexity of the term art that defines its very mission. We have attempted to question and expand the limits imposed by this category through specific collecting projects. Take the case of photography. The efforts made in the early 20th century to bring amateur photography into the sphere of fine arts largely failed. Though there were a few photographs in the collection, they were never actively collected or incorporated into the museum's narratives. It took a concerted effort at the end of the 90s to introduce photography as an essential part of the museum's mission. With the support of Jorge Villacorta, we organized a series of exhibitions that sought to shape the lo local history of the medium. The project combined both the high modernist tradition and the work of 20th century commercial studios as well as regional and popular photography. As an offshoot of these efforts, in recent years, we have been working to reconstruct the history of the genre of painted portraits, which were immensely popular among the urban and regional middle classes starting in the 30s. Beyond aestheticist debates, this tradition is central to a history of social groups otherwise absent from the narrative of the museum presents to its public. It allows us to trace the ways in which photography disseminates through commercial circuits the prestige of painting to broader audiences. We could see illuminated photography as an extension of the history of painting, sorry, or at least of its symbolic and commercial permutations in the modern Andean world. These works introduce an aesthetic sensibility vastly different from established canons. They further weave alternative narratives when confronted with other works in the collection like Mavi, Maria Quispe, 2008, produced by Mexican artist Joshua Ocon during a residence in Lima on the basis of the archive of a commercial photographic studio from which he selected the pictures of women by the name of Maria Quispe, the local equivalent of John Doe, photographed between 1968 and 2008. The emplacement of those homonymous portraits united by a name that has served the discourses of racism to identify Indian migrants evokes other aspects of the collection relating to internal migration and the operation of ethnic categories in the national imagination. Ocon's intervention in the archive recovers the memory of commercial photographic studios, allowing for a transverse history that contributes to forge new narratives regarding the region's visual culture. Photography has indeed been crucial to broaden and expand the cultural field which the museum contributes to construct. Yet the collection continues to exclude a number of cultural forms that lie outside of the more conventional purview of art. Two recent projects, a nucleus of works relating broadly to the Amazon and another focused on textiles, seek to actively push the limits of the collection and escape expanded scope, moving towards types of production associated with notions of material culture or ethnography. Textiles are doubtless one of the most significant cultural expressions of the Andes and one which nonetheless is underrepresented in Peruvian museums. Throughout the 20th century, Peruvian colonial and Republican textiles have been intensely collected by European and North American museums. One of the major collections of this type, in fact, is here in Berlin. Yet no local institution has made a consistent effort to preserve this tradition. 
to the point that entire typologies are absent from public collections. This is not the place to explore the reasons why textiles fell between the cracks. It is certainly understandable that they should have been avoided by traditional collectors by Javier Prado, but perhaps less so that many of the indigenous artists of the early 20th century did not demonstrate equal interest in textiles as they did for Andean ceramics or Catholic imagery, because perhaps this was too much of an Indian tradition to fit their notion of mestizaje, the ideal fusion of Hispanic and Indian culture. Perhaps they were too Indian. While it is possible to trace lines of continuity between this production and the great pre-Columbian textile tradition, it is also important to emphasize the changing history of Andean culture before, during, and after the Spanish conquest in order to avoid essentialist narratives. It is also a challenge to think of textiles produced after the 19th and 20th centuries as a counterpoint to the visual culture created within the modern concept of the fine arts. Textiles challenge our notions of time, modernity, and culture. They also allow us to rethink the historical dimension of contemporaneity, to recognize it as a distinct tradition that emerges as a construct of the globalized economy. This is a critical issue at a moment when contemporary culture is conceived as radically different from any precedent, when the present is uprooted from historical process. But today I want to focus on our emerging Amazon collection, an initiative that we began to think about a few years back when we fell into the double realization that while there are scarcely any images in the museum's holdings relating to the cultural production of the indigenous groups of the Amazon, there was an increasing number of works in our contemporary holdings that related to the Amazon. Among them, for example, Eddie Hirosi's photographs of the community of Austrian and German settlers established in Posuso at the rim of the jungle in the 1850s and forced into isolation by the failed promise of the Peruvian government to build access roads, a project that reveals a long history of cultural hybridity in the Amazon that questions narratives of isolation, purity, and cultural essentialism. Likewise, the focus on popular urban culture, largely torn by poverty, sexual tourism, violence, drug trafficking, and illegal mining, that has attracted the interest of Christian Bendayan, an artist who has fostered a dialogue between Lima and the scene in Iquitos, a city that has become a significant site for exchange with the Lima art world, or Gilda Mantilla for that case. On another extreme, Nancy La Rosa's triple projection, Temporary Settlements, which borrows popular images to recreate the sense of enigma and the fascination that surrounds indigenous communities living in voluntary isolation, that final frontier of otherness. That horizon is explored by Carlos Mota, the defeated, a video work inspired by oral tradition, which narrates in the voice of an Indian slave the conqueror's encounter with a homoerotic ritual and the ensuing execution of the indigenous men, a tale that brings a long history of violence into dialogue with critical issues of the present. Exotic sexual fantasies are further explored in Jose Alejandro Restrepo's pioneering Anaconda, which revisits the er erotic archetypes of the jungle. The inclusion of these artists reflects the openness of a collection, which attempts to respond to the complex political geographies of the Amazon, where national borders are constantly shifting and in many cases, largely irrelevant. Created from the discourses of international contemporary art, such works offer a critical perspective largely from without the local cultures of the Amazon. This is relatively easy for the museum and its curatorial staff. Yet the institution faces a greater challenge and responsibility of engaging the cultural production of artists from the region, a project for which we are not adequately prepared. This year, we began uh, a series of conversations with artists, anthropologists, and experts who either come from the Amazon or have devoted their lives to the study of the region. This has be, proved to be an extraordinary platform for discussion and learning, which has the potential of turning the museum's initiative into a structure for multiple collaborations. As we move forward, we have begun to address the production of artists from original groups who work at the crossroads of native culture and urban pictorial traditions. Painting has, in fact, become an important vehicle for indigenous memory. Artists explicitly refer to their works as a contribution to the preservation of native beliefs and history. Both aspects are taken up in works by Santiago Yahuarcani, recently acquired by the museum. 
like Cosmovision Aymeni, where he records a Witoto worldview, or the heart of the Robert Barons, where he creates a scathing document of one of the chapters of greatest pillage and destruction in Amazon history, the decimation of the native population enslaved by the large rubber companies at the turn of the century. <clears throat> the piece translates into visual form what is largely oral history learned from, through the voice of his elders. The premise of cultural isolation is challenged by these works, evidently produced as part of a dialogue between cultural practices of the Amazon and urban production. Bruce Rubio from Pau Carquillo returns this gaze in his large-scale painting, Researchers at the House of the Cocamera, made with natural dyes on the Anchama bark during a stay in Paris. The painting shows two anthropologists studying his community while being oblivious to the forces of nature with which only the natives can connect. The painting turns the anthropologist into the object of study and reverses the direction of the observing gaze. Such works remind us of the complexities of dialogic relations in the Amazon but they, and the permanently shifting identities in a world that is far from being the distant other of urban fantasies. These artists work in a space of transition between communities creating within native culture and the urban international art scene. The museum cannot ignore either, which forces us to radically rethink the premises on which our collections have been built. For the dangers of allochronism, that of thinking the Amazon like a place dominated by another time, outside of history, we have the opposite danger, that of coevalness, of absolute contemporaneity, where we pay attention only to those works that somehow operate within the premises of canonical art. That challenges us to understand how to incorporate it, and what's more important, how to exhibit objects like stools, ceramics, or even body painting, where a vital aesthetic expression of indigenous cultures in which have traditionally been seen to lie outside the purview of the collection. The conversations with artists and specialists that is guiding our work points in that direction. Further, there are presidents in the region, like the Museo del Barro in Asuncion, which has attempted to overcome the stasis of aesthetic and disciplinary categories. The task of rethinking the traditional borders separating art and ethnography shall be difficult, yet these hybrid collections open the doors to a, an alternative out of the normalization produced by global art circuits. The process of building these collections has clearly emphasized the need to permanently challenge the operative categories with, with which we work, terms like modern, traditional, Indian, or Amazonian, which in fact refer to permanently changing realities. The universe of cultural production, as well as the vast diversity and the constant transformation of situations with which we must deal with, is always greater than the descriptive designations and the categories we use. We do not want to offer a unified representation of a region, but a prison-like set of images which can activate a critical process of thought regarding not only what is a particular geography, but also an important symbolic horizons in our historical imagination. New collecting areas, whether by medium or geographic categories, are allowing us to move beyond the double bind in which the peripheral museums are often caught between a salvage anthropology and a cosmopolitan mirage. Thank you. Thank you.